Hello, true believers. This is Hank Garner. This is M.A. Phipps. Hey, this is Andy Pelliquin. Hey, guys, this is Ernie Howard. You're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 minute author interviews with my buddy Preston Lay. Woohoo! Welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Thank you for joining us today, Kelly Metting. Thank you for having me. Um, for those that might not know anything about you, why don't you kind of tell them who you are and what you do? I am an author of mostly urban fantasy, but I write urban fantasy, superhero novels. I dabble a little bit in paranormal romance, uh, a little bit with the kind of modern sci-fi. So mostly a writer and a mother of two adorable cats. There we go. Cats. <laughs> cats are babies, too. I have two dogs, so we call them. Our, certainly are. Call them our fur babies. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> we, <laughs> We even got my mother-in-law a sticker that says, I love my grandpups. <laughs> so, oh, I need to find one that says, I love my grandkitties for my mom. <laughs> I'm sure you have Etsy or eBay or something. I'm sure. Bro, it's somebody's going to have one. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> uh, so you are, uh, you're a hybrid author. Uh, you've had stuff published and you self-published. Um, yes. h- how did you get into writing? And then you know, l- let's do that first. What What made you decide to writing what gave you the writing bug growing up or whenever uh, i guess it it was kind of a convoluted way because i originally especially when i was in high school i wanted to work more in film and i even went to college to specifically get a film studies concentration with my communication degree mm-hmm. and while i was i kind of dabbled in writing a little bit and i did like the email based rpgs and stuff like that for fun And it was in college when I took a screenwriting course with a gentleman named Chris Young, who'd had some produced screenplays. He was probably the first person who was a professional writer in any capacity who said, you could do this. So at the time, I was like, well, maybe I could try screenwriting. Um, You know, I wrote a couple screenplays and actually what became the novel Oracle, which released earlier this year, originated as a pilot TV script, if you believe that. Okay. Yeah, I wrote two episodes. Wow. Um, and then had a whole like outlines for other other things to go. But then I'm thinking, you know, I went into my senior year in college. And I'm thinking, I am a girl from Southern Delaware. How on earth am I going to get into screenplays and like actually selling them to Hollywood? So I started concentrating a little bit more on, on prose writing and actually doing novels and things like that. And that's kind of how the focus shifted over and what became Oracle was one of the probably the second full length novels that I wrote. I adapted my own screenplay, but it didn't, you know, it's one of those things that I wasn't sure what I was doing. So I trunked it for a long, long time. Um, and then just kind of went from there. Have you done any more screenplay writing or have you kind of just put that off to the side now? Pretty much put it off to the side. I, even now I wouldn't know how to get back into actually selling screenplays. Although, you know, there is a huge uh, independent market now compared to what this was probably about 14 or 15 years ago Mm -hmm. when I was in school. So there would probably be more opportunity to produce independent productions. But again, I live in the middle of nowhere, you know, in Southern Maryland by the beach. So there's not a whole lot going on around here (laughs) in terms of filmmaking, so I haven't really gone back to that at all in a long time. Now, I read in an interview uh, you did online that you were when you were young, you wrote some Sweet Valley High fanfic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you still have those? I do not. Uh, the original manuscript, uh, as I call it, I loaned it out to my then best friend. I think it was seventh grade when I wrote that mess. <laughs> and we got into the fight that only 12, 13 year old girls can get into. So she ripped it to shreds and flushed it down the toilet. (laughs) (laughs) It was devastating at the time. Looking back, it's actually kind of funny. (laughs) She should have kept it. (laughs) because It could have been a collector's item. It could have, because you actually got picked (laughs) up by, it was random how she got picked up by, right? Yes. Um, How did that, happen um did, did you self-publish before you got picked up by random house for your dreg series or i did not um i actually went the agent route i started querying agents i want to say around 2006 
And I went through a couple of, I think, two other books querying before I got the idea and actually wrote Three Days to Dead. And when I started querying that one, I actually ended up at around the same time, I had one agent interested in a partial, one who wanted the full, and then I actually got an offer of representation. So it was kind of this whirlwind of trying to decide what to do and where to go. So I ended up, I think it was Memorial Day weekend, 2008, when I finally signed with my agent. And he was the one who ended up selling the book. And we made the deal that summer. So it only took a couple of months. Oh, wow. Uh, for those that don't know anything about your Dreg City um, series, what's kind of the book blur without spoilers on what that series is about? Well, the fun elevator pitch is that it's about a paranormal bounty hunter who wakes up in someone else's body in a morgue and has three days to solve her own murder. Mm-hmm. That's kind of just like the the one liner for the first book. So it's kind of I like to call it kind of my kitchen sink urban fantasy series where there is a little bit of everything. There are shape there are shifters, vampires, gremlins, gargoyles, trolls, fairies, all kinds of paranormal creatures in this in and around this city. And there's a secret group of they call themselves drag hunters, and that's kind of like the the mean slang word for the paranormal people. But there's a secret group who work with the police to basically keep all these kind of crazy creatures under control. Um, And there's a whole conspiracy behind why my main character was killed. And then she gets brought back and it just messes with everybody's plans. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) (laughs) I actually, um, I remember when I, I think I read the first chapter and the way that she discovered she wasn't in her body. I was pretty entertained by I thought that was. Yeah, it was a pretty fun opening line. Like you basically just wake up and you're like, hmm, this yeah, isn't me. That's right. Um, what What was your inspiration to for that series or for the start of that series? One of the inspirations was actually a very little known show that was on UPN before it was the CW slash or no, it was UPN and WB became the CW. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Um, it was on in the late 90s, I think, um, but it was called Special Unit 2. And it's a funny, funny series because it's basically a very sarcastic male cop and his slightly more entertaining female counterpart who have the special unit is basically a unit in Chicago that polices craziness in the city. And they were kind of a melting pot. Like they had Cupid, they had vampires, they had a little bit of everything, all kinds of paranormal and folklore and stuff. And I thought that was just a really fun concept. Um, I wanted to kind of do something like that in terms of world building for Dreg City and that they have, you know, it's not just a world of vampires and shapeshifters, but there's a little bit of everything going on. Um, And it also, you know, urban fantasy was just starting to explode. So there was already that, you know, it's going to be a female point of view, a little bit of sarcasm, a lot of action. So it all just kind of started coming together. Sounds good. And so you said uh, there's there's six books in that series, which you just wrapped up uh, in February of this year. And mm-hmm. the first four books were Random House and then you self-published. Was it the last two? Correct. What can you tell us what? happened there and then why you decided to make it six books instead of just four? Well, the series, basically I signed two, two book contracts with random house and the sales just weren't there. Okay. Um, you know, people like the first book has sold like crazy. There's, you know, sold a lot of copies. It actually is the only book of mine that actually earned out its advance, but in a series, people have to pick up book two. Right. And then they have to pick up book three. So it was like the numbers just really were not there for books three and four. And I wanted to end the series for my readers because, okay. you know, they had been with me through a lot. My main character, Evie Stone, had been put through a lot. Um, I'm not afraid to torture my characters. <laughs> that is a well-known fact among my fans. Um But I also, when I first set out to write her book, I knew how I wanted the series to end. And I wanted to be able to get all of the little story arcs and the major arcs and what I had started in book one. I wanted to finally bring it to its natural conclusion by book six. 
And I was, I was really happy to be able to do that and to say her story is over, but the world is still there. If I choose to do, you know, short stories or maybe do something from another character's point of view. Um, so now you're, you're an indie publisher. Would you ever consider going back to traditionally published or would you stay indie for the rest of your career? I would love to be, to go back to a traditional public publishing house. Excuse me. Um, a couple of days ago, I actually sent a new project to my agent. Um, it's definitely old school urban fantasy. So, you know, female protagonist in paranormal world. So we'll see if that comes to anything. If, you know, if New York doesn't want me anymore, then I'm more than happy to keep going indie. What, what is it that draws you uh, to traditional publishing versus indie publishing? Are there more benefits for you to be traditionally published? There's a little less work for me to be traditionally published. Right. Um, like I don't have to source out the editing or the cover art or the formatting or proofreading. All of that's taken care of by the house. I feel like there's a little bit more marketing involved. Definitely not a lot more unless you're one of the big authors. You know, I've yeah, we'll not go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, mar- you know, there's a little bit more in terms of marketing and in actually getting your books as long as you get physical, you know, like paperback distribution as part of the deal, there is more opportunity to actually get your book in bookstores. Gotcha. And your uh, latest project that you're going to be wrapping up here pretty soon is um, the Project Files. Uh, the first book was Oracle. Uh, what's the little book blurb on that series? I used to call this series the X-Men meets the A-Team. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a little – I call it kind of modern sci-fi because it's got a lot of scientifically based elements to it, but it's still – a, like fantasy as well. It's just set in modern times. Um, the people, the characters in it have powers that, you know, telepathy, telekinesis, pyrokinesis, things like that, but they're all based on the function of their brain. They're not like, you know, gifted these from a mystical being or anything. It's a, a lot of it's actually based in science. Mm-hmm. And there's a little group of people that are on the run from the scientific research company that basically created them. And then they help uh, scientists kidnap, basically, um, an Android prototype so that the military doesn't get it. And then they all end up on the run. So there's a little bit of action, a little bit of mystery. There's some characters in there. You're like, what are, what are they up to? So. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so for this Project Files, it's going to be a uh, duology, which uh, isn't done very much. It seems that trilogies or more is kind of – the norm for books. Um, why only a duology for this series? I didn't have enough story to make it a trilogy. Um, the original, when I put all of what I had written together, the a single novel would have been about 170,000 words, which is like a George R. R. Martin doorstopper. <laughs> and I didn't really want to do that. But I also, when I split it, there's not enough for three books. They would have been three really, really skinny books. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I'll just cut it in the middle, find a good place, you know, to stop where the first arc or the arc of the first book still makes sense. And there's conclusion while there's still some dangling questions that make you go, I need to read book two. And so you said you that the Oracle actually started out as a screenplay. Um, how much of that screenplay actually made it into the book? Did you completely change the story or did you kind of stay with your original story idea? I stayed pretty close to what I remember of the screenplays. I actually unearthed my physical copies of them only a few weeks ago. I was surprised I still had them. (laughs) But a lot of it, especially in Oracle, was probably, I'd say about 85, 90% was what was in the screenplays in terms of dialogue and action and the the different story beats. So that had been, I guess, the two-hour pilot, so to speak, of what could have become a series. Mm-hmm. And when I adapted it into prose, I realized it probably wasn't going to be this ongoing series of books. So but when I wrote what became Lazarus, book two, I had kind of come to a full-on conclusion to some of the characters' arcs and to some of what was happening. So there's a little bit of wiggle room if I ever wanted to return and do like a follow-up. 
but it definitely, you definitely get a conclusion to the first book. Gotcha. And so you said the second one is going to be called Lazarus. Yes. When, when, uh, is there a time frame you're looking at for when that one might be coming out? I am hoping for around Halloween of this year. Okay. And do you have anything in the works after you finish that up? Um, not in particular. Like I said, I had a new project go out to my agent, so I'm going to be fiddling with that for a little while. I have a lot of other, I have some completed works that I'd like to go back and kind of fiddle with. And I've always got new ideas. My dad is great with coming up with random things and just saying, Hey daughter, what about this? And I'm just like, <laughs> I don't need any more ideas. Thank you. I'm good. <laughs> but he's actually pretty creative in his own right. So that sounds good. Um, <laughs> so uh, you said Oracle, you said was kind of uh, an action sci-fi, and then you had your Dreg series that was more urban fantasy. Um, mm-hmm. uh, d- does one of those genres particularly uh, interest you, or do you just kind of like riding all over the place? I think I de- to definitely tend to lean a bit more towards urban fantasy. I just, I love paranormal worlds and I love writing about mythologies and folklore and things like that. But I also don't, I love reading romance and paranormal romance is one of my go-to genres when I'm in a reading mood, but I'm not as much focused on writing romance in my books. Just kind of, sometimes it just kind of happens. And I actually did publish a paranormal romance werewolf trilogy under a pseudonym a year and a half ago, I think Mm -hmm. that kind of felt like a bomb, but it was kind of a fun foray just to try my hand at writing something specifically romance. And it, you know, it was a fun experience, but I definitely just, I think I kind of, I really found my niche in urban fantasy. Um, Do you find it hard um, to make your work stick out in the urban fantasy world? Uh, Especially when you said you wrote that urban fantasy was really starting to get big. Um, did you have a hard time trying to come up with an idea that made your stick out compared to the others? I don't think I did at the time because I got in right in that 2008, 2009 time period when urban fantasy was just starting to really explode as a genre. Mm -hmm. So there weren't a lot of series out yet. A lot of us were publishing our first novels in a series in that year, year and a half time frame. And all of them were very different. I, you know, I picked up a lot. We, a lot of us talked online and, you know, it was just, it was a, it was a new field, you know, it wasn't as popular as it has become. So there were a lot of opportunity to be original. Um, And like I said, I think my first book hit on a lot of what people were kind of looking for in terms of an original world and an original concept. It just didn't catch on and stay in readers' minds the way some other series did. Gotcha. Because there were so, so many of us, and a lot, a lot of series ended up canceled at books, you know, two, three, and four. Right. Um, now, I know you did an Audible f- version of uh, Three Days to Dead. Um, oh, Tan- Tantor. Do what? It was an audio book, but it was yeah. through Tantor Media. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, do you plan on doing uh, audio books for the rest of that series? Because um, I know not all of them have the uh, audio book option. I would love it if that happens. Um, we haven't heard anything from Tantor about the other three books about, a, geez, I think it was maybe almost a year, two, year and a half ago. We had an offer from Audible for the last, last three books, but okay. there's just been this long back and forth. I guess Audible is very difficult for some agencies to negotiate terms with so we haven't heard anything in a while okay so so it's just the first three books that have an audio version and then the uh the final three books are ebook and paperback right correct gotcha w- what is something that maybe you're good at that a lot of people don't know that you are good at uh i thought about you know, i was thinking about this earlier like a lot of the things that i'm kind of good at people generally know like i really love to cook and i'm a pretty good cook Mm-hmm. So I was like, there's kind of one thing I don't tell a lot of people. It's more of a party trick than anything else. But um, I can tie a cherry stem into a knot using just my tongue. Oh, there you go. I can't. 
<laughs> Not many people can. It definitely impresses people when you're in a bar. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, th- now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. I haven't asked too many authors that have come on here. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite line that you've written in any of your books? And if so, what is it if it doesn't really spoil anything? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I don't even know. I'd have to research that one. (laughs) If anything, it's probably something that Evie said, because there's a lot of my own sarcastic humor in that character. And I've had people tell me that that know me that they could hear my voice in her sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it's some snarky, sarcastic thing that she said in one of the books, but I honestly couldn't tell you what. Oh, that's fine. Uh, what's the uh, what's the strangest thing if someone was to go on your computer history that you've had to research for a book? Definitely one of the stranger things would have to be rabies. Uh, <laughs> okay. When in my Drag City series, the, when I originally wrote the first book or two, I had said that you know, there are shapeshifters, but there were no wolf shifters like there was no such thing as a werewolf and then when i got into book three i think was the first time they mentioned it it was because that that species was supposedly extinct Mm -hmm. um they were basically killed off because the bite of that shifter to a human would kind of act the same way as rabies did where it would be like this virus that reacted really badly in your system and could potentially kill you so i kind of I use that research as a foundation for what I call the Lupa virus, which is when my fictional werewolves would bite a human. So that was a very interesting thing to learn about. <laughs> That's that is interesting. Um, now, if you could write in any author's world without, you know, having to get permission or whatever, uh, which author's world would you love to do like a little fan fiction in and why? Oh, can I pick comic books? That's fine. <laughs> it's not current anymore, but I I first got started reading comic books in early 90s, I think. I had discovered what was um, – back then it was the New Teen Titans, which was being written by Marv Wolfett and George Perez. The series started in 1980 and then went on for, I guess, about 12 years in various incarnations – And I just, I fell in love with that series. My first, the first issue I ever bought was issue nine. And then I spent so many times going to yard sales and flea markets and antique stores and online mile, was it Mile High Comics, I think, was one of the places I bought every issue I could find starting from number one. And I just fell in love with the world, with the characters. They were all basically the teenage sidekicks of the Justice League. Right. The original incarnation. And I I would have loved to be able to write a story set in that run of the series. I mean, it's definitely changed. They, you know, every time DC changes things, they have some other giant disaster. And then there's a new line, a new 52, a new whatever. Right. Um, But just going back to the Wolfman Perez era and writing stories or even comic issues with those characters would be amazing. Sounds good. So do you still read um, a bunch of comics? And if so, what's your favorite most recent series that you're reading or storyline i wish i did sometimes i'll pick them up when they bring out the omnibus when they you know collect six or seven issues at a time instead of buying them individually Mm -hmm. so i've kind of peeked into some of the new versions of the titans um some of the outsiders i actually just read the killing joke for the first time in my life a couple of months ago it's one of the like those seminal batman comics Mm -hmm. um just to have said i've read it but Nothing really current that I follow. Like I, I, I'm trying to pick up some of the the classic, no, um, comic novels, basically like Watchmen and Return of the Dark Knight and things like that. So, gotcha. Um, so for a question, I'm sure you've been asked a bunch. What is one of your favorite books of all time, and why? Watership Down by Richard Adams. Really? Um, it is my number one favorite book and has been since I was 12 years old. Um, I grew up watching the animated movie, actually, that I, it was made in the 70s. And it was one of those videos. Anytime we went to the video store and we could rent a cassette tape, I either wanted Star Wars or I wanted Watership Down. 
And um, it just something about the story really appealed to me. I don't know if it was just because they were talking rabbits with British accents, <laughs> but it was the story, you know, of a family and adventure and finding a home. And I didn't even realize it was a book until seventh grade when it ended up on a reading list. And there was this whole it was kind of a contest thing where you could read certain books and then you would go to a computer and take a quiz on it and you would earn points. Mm -hmm. And the person with the most points at the end of the year won sort of some sort of award. And I'm pretty sure I won that year. <laughs> uh, and the book like big books like Watership Down were worth like 36 points, you know, and like little skinny paperbacks are worth like three points. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, okay, it's a book. So I read it and I just fell in love with it because the movie is, it's only a tiny slice of the story. There's all kinds of mythology and there, this author created this own language for these rabbits. And it was just this beautiful, sweeping epic story. And I've never read anything since that has surpassed that experience for me. I guess I'll have to go back and reread it because <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is going to make you cringe. I had to read that book in middle school and back in middle school, I hated reading. Um, I actually didn't get into reading until I met who is now my wife. And she told me, you should read the Harry Potter series. Uh, not all the books were out. I think only f maybe four or five of them were. So back in middle school, I was a, in Boy Scouts. I played sports. And that, you know, that was kind of, and I was big into music. And that was my life. So I hated reading. And the teacher asked us if we could. They, We were asked if we would buy the book because there wasn't enough available for everybody to read it or something. So my parents bought the book. And as we went through reading that book, I dug a hole from the top of the book through the chapter that we had to read. And so by the time we got through the book, I had a big old hole from the front to the back <laughs> of, that, <laughs> of that book. So that's the only thing I remember about reading that book is I had a big old hole in mine when I got done. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's a very, very long book. And I've been a reader since I was a small child. My mom would take my sister and I, who are both big readers, to a library about 25 minutes from our town because – they had an, you could take an unlimited number of books oh, wow. for two weeks. And we would, we would take like 30 books a piece mm -hmm. because we read, that was all, all summer long. We would sit down and read. Um, so I can imagine, you know, anybody that's not already a big reader being forced to look at a book that thick and that complex, especially in middle school going, this, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that was me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to go back and reread it. Yeah, it might it might have a little bit more I don't know, it might might come across better as an adult. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to go get it from my library here if they have it. So uh, I have three different copies. That's because that's the only thing I remember is putting a hole all the way through mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, well, uh, here at the Legendarian, we like to end our podcast on kind of a not so serious note, um, like that story wasn't. But um, uh, <laughs> so we're going to jump into what we call the legendary ending. <laughs> um, so for this first question, like I said, they're just all random questions, just fun. Um, uh, I'm going to ask a question I've only asked a few other authors, and it's going to be a take on what I just asked you, and that is, what book or book series have you read that you just did not care for? Hmm. I don't want to say hate, because hate's a strong one. No, yeah, hate. I, <laughs> I can't think of any... Well, no, I could think of a book that I hated. Never mind. <laughs> Um, let, I have never, I, I've read two books by Toni Morrison and I did not enjoy the experience either time. Um, both of them were from an AP English class that could have something to do with it, right. but I just did not, I don't know if it's, it was the voice or what it was, but I just resented having to read both those books. Um, I, yeah, they, they were not my style. I, I, I do read literary novels. Um, I don't read them very often, but there was just something. And maybe it was just because the English teacher loved the book so much. So she built it up and I'm just like, mm -mm -mm, this is not for me. <laughs> there we go. Um, what songs are currently on your writing playlist? Oh, goodness. Um, 
my playlist is still strangely enough covered filled with a lot of covers from glee i was a huge fan of glee when it was on the air probably through season four after that i got bored but i just the music that they made was so eclectic and really well done so i definitely have a long playlist that i'll put on when i'm writing if you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, which one of your book characters would you want to be stuck with and why? Oh, I would totally want to be stuck with my Drake City character, Phineas, because he is an Osprey shifter. And he is also a bi shifter, which means that he has three shapes. He is human, he is Osprey, and he is also semi in between. He's a giant man with huge wings, so he can basically fly us away from anything. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, he's hot. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. He gets you away from the zombies, and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hot and single. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, if you could pick, it, uh, pick any character from any media source, comics, books, movies, whoever to be stuck in a zombie apocalypse with who would you want and why? Oh, I would totally want Mark Ruffalo's version of Bruce Banner slash the Hulk because the Hulk would just kind of Hulk smash his way through any zombie horde and we'd be good. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's actually what Artie Cabrera said too. When I really? thought, he, said, he said he picked the Hulk cause the Hulk would just Hulk smash everything. <laughs> yes. And I like, I love um, Mark's version of Bruce Banner too. So that's kind yeah. of why I went with that one. Uh, if you had a time machine, where would you travel and why? I would actually not. Uh, I have, after mainlining two seasons of the flash back to back, I'm a little leery of doing anything that messes with time and the timeline. So I would probably not travel through time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I think I know the answer to this question based on one of your questions earlier. If you okay. had to pick either Marvel or DC for the rest of your comics, movie, and television entertainment, which one would you pick? Oh, I yeah, I def I would in honor of the Teen Titans, I would have to give that one to DC. Um, and I'm also getting into the DC shows that are on the CW. I absolutely have enjoyed the first two seasons of the flash. And I'm so happy Supergirl is over there too. Yeah. Um, So yeah, I'd have to go with DC. (laughs) And if you could have one superpower, what superpower would you like to have and why? Oh, that's a hard one. (laughs) There's so many to choose from. There are so many to choose from. (laughs) I think invisibility would be fun. Okay. Just because you could go anywhere and listen to anyone and watch whatever anybody is doing and they would have no clue you're there. That's right. And it'd be kind of fun to like whisper in their ear to make them think they're crazy. That's right. I hear voices. (laughs) Exactly. You really do hear voices. You just can't see me. That's right. (laughs) Um, Let's say a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and why is he here? I walked all the way from the Arctic Circle, so your mango chicken tacos better be worth it, woman. (laughs) There we go. Um, And before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with our listeners? Oh, goodness. Um, I suppose just be true to yourself. You know, if you're an author, write what makes you happy. In your regular life, just, you know, be who you are as best as you can, unless, you know, you're a serial killer. Don't do that. (laughs) Then don't be you. (laughs) (laughs) Then don't be you. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Don't embrace the negative traits. Embrace the positive ones. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) And where can our listeners go if they'd like to learn more about you or your books? Uh, They can definitely check out my website, www.kellymedding.com. Um, you can also find a link to my blog. I am on Twitter under the handle Kelly Medding, Facebook, and I'm on Pinterest. And you can find my books on all the major retailers, Amazon, Barnes Noble, Kobo, etc. Sounds good. Well, thank you for taking time to uh, join us on 30-Minute Author Interviews. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, guys, that's all the time we've got for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to 30-Minute Author Interviews. Head on over to Legendarium.com. That's L-E-I-G-H-G-E-N-D-A-R-I-U-M.com. And find the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, Kelly has a giveaway going on where she's going to be giving away a signed copy of Oracle plus a $10 Barnes & Noble gift card. 
The giveaway will run until Friday, October 7th, 2016. Until next time, guys, stay legendary. Oh, screwed that one up. Blooper reel.